That's what I want to do right now is kind of share uh, what God's given to my heart for you today. Actually, the passage that I'm going to share about, uh, Matthew 11, and by the way, I know we're kind of circling back to things we've covered before, but this passage has just been uh, really, oh, I've been living in it, uh, to maybe put it that way, for a few months now. Uh, I spoke on this in Thailand to the pastors and wives there, and God just put it on my heart to share uh, this word of compassion and invitation that you're going to hear this morning. And then, you know, when I was realizing today was the day that um, I'm speaking again, the Lord just uh, said, that's it. This is the passage. I want to talk to the people I love at Harvest about my heart, and I want to invite them into it in a deeper place. I love anything having to do with God's heart, as you know, and so this is a beautiful place to, to be, to dwell. So... This version of the message that I'm sharing with you right now is kind of a New Year's version of it, as you can see by the title, because I really think there are gifts from this loving, compassionate heart of God that he wants to give you today. There's three, but there's so much more that God wants to give, and I want you to be listening as you hear the word spoken uh, for God's spirit. And what it is that he does want to impart to you, he will tell you, he will quicken your heart, he'll help you realize this is it, this is something that I need, that I long for. We are going to create a place for prayer ministry at the end of my teaching because uh, it's so important that when we sometimes need a touch from God, having someone pray for us, with us, is so much more effective. So be ready for that. And that's it's just all a part of, of receiving today from, from the heart of God. So this passage, uh, I'm just going to pray and we're going to jump right in and read it. Lord, thank you for the heart you have for every single person listening right now to this message. Thank you, Jesus, that you want to come alongside us and you want to give us everything we need so that we can live for you, God that we can serve you, that we can find your calling and your direction and your voice, and we can do the things that you've asked us to do, Lord. That's our heart, to say yes to you. So God, come, speak, connect with our hearts. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. All right, the passage is the famous classic Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30, Jesus' amazing words, and here they are. Come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want to point out something uh, before I kind of dive into this passage that I learned by, uh, from another author, but there's one verse in the entire Bible, and it's in this passage, one verse in which Jesus tells us himself what his heart is like. Only one verse in the Bible where he says, this is my heart. Now, we learn a lot about God's heart throughout the whole Bible. We learn about Jesus' heart by reading the Gospels. We discover what his heart is like. But in only one place, right here, verse 29, does Jesus say, this is my heart. And when Jesus reveals his heart, self-revelation, he says, I am humble and gentle in heart. That's what he wants you to know. That's his heart. That's his message. That is the kind of connection that he wants to have with you and I. He does not have an angry heart toward you. His heart is not vengeful. It is not a distant heart that you can't ever connect with. It is not uncaring. He does not have a demanding heart that just wants you to do so much more and everything and just get busy and work for me. His heart is not 
unpleasable. In other words, it is a pleasable heart that can be pleased. It's gentle, humble, tender, loving, welcoming. He's compassionate. He is patient. He is forgiving, generous, understanding, helpful. He is willing. He has a heart of gentle care for those who come to him. And that's the problem with many of us is we believe God's heart to be something it isn't. We believe lies about him and his heart that affect our ability to come close and trust him and feel safe with him. So may the Holy Spirit give revelation today of what the true heart of Jesus is so that we can literally accept that invitation that he issues at the very beginning of that passage, come to me, come to me. You're going to come to somebody who's loving and caring and gentle and open and receptive. And that's what he wants us all to do in whatever way we need to do that today. It's really important that we understand the context of this passage. It really helps us in all things. It helps us not only understand what Jesus is teaching, but it helps us understand how to apply that teaching. That's why the context is so important anytime we read the scripture. And in Matthew 11, and actually much of Matthew, as you know, as we've been going through the series... Jesus is helping his followers break free from the religious system of his day that focused on keeping all the rules, right? The system of the scribes and Pharisees that taught that you were a good person if you obeyed all the, you know, their man-made rules. And uh, basically, they just presented a system of outward conformity and not inner reality. You know, you're pleasing to God if you try your best to keep their long list of impossible demands that no one could fully keep, you know. People just ended up getting discouraged and worn out. Worn out on religion, on trying to be religious and pleasing to God. Eugene Peterson really catches the heart of uh, this passage in his message version. Isn't it great? Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn, love this phrase, the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything ill-fitting or heavy on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Wow. So, heavy and burdened. How are you guys doing? Like right now in your life. Heavy and burdened. You know God knows exactly how you're doing. He sees every part of you right from head to toe. The deepest, deepest parts of your life this moment. He sees how tired you are, how worn out you are, how burdened you are. He sees those hard times that are going on right now in your life. For some of you in your family, at work, he sees it all. He sees the hard things at school, in your walk with God, in your ministry, in your desire to serve him. You know, he sees all that. He sees every part and the hard things in particular that you're going through and just loves you in it. He just has such compassion and such desire to connect with you in that place of hurt. You know, not to mention just living in the world that we're living in right now that is constantly, it just seems to be getting worse. All the stuff that's happening globally, wars, rumors of wars, things are rising up. It's just, this is one of the, most tense times we've had to live in in a long time. And so, you know, you turn on the news and boom, it just lands on you like a weight. You know, all the darkness and stuff. God sees it. He sees everything going on in your life. and He loves you and he really wants to give you his rest. And that's the first gift today. 
Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. How many of you need God's rest today? Yeah, I think a lot of us do. What is God's rest, you're asking? Well, it is this. It's a sense of calm despite outward chaos. It is a deep inner settledness despite outward circumstances. It is choosing quiet trust in God versus frantic activity. It is finding the gift of peace despite the many demands of life. It is letting God do things rather than you having to make things happen. Jesus promises rest for our souls. I'm intrigued by that. He doesn't say rest for your bodies. Isn't that interesting? Because a lot of us think rest comes that we just kind of need a two-week beach vacation, you know, and then we're going to feel better. And, you know, if we just don't have to do anything. But that's not what he's talking about. You see, we don't always find the physical rest we need, but we certainly can find the spiritual and emotional rest we need from him, which then gives our physical bodies the rest it needs to understand. I'm talking about an inside-out rest, not an outside-in rest. Rest God from God does not come from the right outer circumstances, but rather from the right inner condition. And you and I know it's that his rest does not mean getting a break from work, but rather finding his rest within work. Oh, God's rest, it is anchored in the Sabbath, the creation, it's anchored in God's principle of work six days, take a rest on the seventh. That's where it comes from. And as, if we discover a pattern like that, a cycle like that, then rest is the result. We will experience it. But for our lives, I know. I know how hard it is for me. I'm not even sure what a Sabbath is. What does it mean to actually take one day? But God wants us to get into this, to discover that pattern again. And, you know, I was chatting with Melissa this morning. She said I could mention this. She was talking about the Emotionally Healthy Relationships course that's just been done and connected to that, the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality course. And she has said that the two minutes of silence she observes before she jumps into her Bible has been life-changing. So what she does and what the course teaches is kind of Pete Cesaro's teaching on, uh, he calls it the Daily Devotional, before jumping in, even to Bible reading and prayer, she sits in silence without saying anything, without, you know, just focusing on God, often with just one word, Jesus, Jesus, two minutes minimally, at least. And she says, that time has been so life-changing. Even it's like a mini sabbatical within your entire life. And God has met her in that quiet place. And she says, things surface that have to come out. So you know what, we, if you can't think of a 24-hour Sabbath going, how is that possible? Even a two-minute, just a place of quiet. And I know when I do that, and I just all I say is, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, man, rest starts to come. It starts. So, folks, there's a gift waiting for you, and we have something we can do as well to connect with God and partner with him in giving us that gift. Quickly, there's... Um, Another connection to rest, and it is from Hebrews 4, that says there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest, here it is, also rests from their works, just as God did from his. So we understand here, too, that God's rest is anchored in salvation. Salvation, folks, as you know, is a choice to not try to save ourselves anymore, to give up trying to be good, self-righteous, get ourselves to heaven, Putting our faith in Jesus alone for our salvation, that is a place of rest. It's a rest from works. And so once again, we just come back to the source of it all, the cross, what Jesus did for us. And we say, Lord, I need your rest practically in my life right now. How many of you guys need rest today? Any indication of that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've been really asking the Lord how to process this because there's, there's two more gifts he wants to talk about. Um, 
So hang on, <laughs> okay, hang on. Don't go anywhere, because uh, we want to pray for you. That is, um, yeah, it's highly important. Second thing, his yoke. He wants to give you his yoke. Take my yoke and learn from me, he says. So you know that a yoke is a heavy wooden bar laid across the neck of two oxen that are forced to pull a cart or a plow through a field. It is heavy, difficult work. Sometimes being a follower of Jesus feels like heavy, difficult work. But according to Jesus' words, his yoke, the one that he wants you to wear, is light and easy. It's a yoke of kindness, not of impossible demands. Once again, this does not mean that life is easy and serving God has no difficulty. It means that God's yoke is a yoke we can handle. Not because we're so strong, but because he is so strong. And I think that's why I love that picture. I had that hanging in my office over many years, and uh, I just feel like that little boy, you know, trying to do the work and try to get it all done and thinking that it's all on my shoulders and so many times not recognizing the fact that he's in there with me, right in that yoke, pulling doing the work, and I'm just with him as a partner. So we're all in this room, I would think most of us, probably all of us, we're all devoted, hardworking Christian people. We're all Marthas to a large degree. Marys as well. There's, there's Marys in this room for sure. We're a mixture of both. You know, we've got a Martha side, we've got a Mary side. Uh, a lot of Christian people have a predominantly Martha side. It's interesting. I've really taken surveys of this in a lot of churches that I've been a part of. And when you ask, you know, who do you most, you know, connect with uh, in, in terms of Martha or Mary? Most people connect with Martha, the worker. And that's great. That is fantastic. Church needs Marthas. We need people who are dedicated workers. But the truth is, we put on ourselves a heavy, ill-fitting yoke that even Jesus wouldn't ask us to wear. You know, so many of us are trying to do more than our share for the Lord and his work. And why? You have to ask, why do people do this? It's true. Sometimes we do it because there is something unhealed in us some place of brokenness, you know, some need we have to prove ourselves, prove something to somebody, to earn God's love, some insecurity, you know, that we're not good enough and we're never enough, and, and so we've got to do more, you know, be better as a Christian. Perfectionism among Christians is rampant. It's debilitating. Thinking that we have to do everything right why is this? You know, perhaps we think because God is perfect, we're supposed to be perfect or, you know, that he expects that. And I know over the years, you know, we've all heard pastoral teaching and we teach high standards. We do. We teach high biblical standards. So we all think, wow, we got to measure up there. But we teach those standards without teaching about grace in the same way, right? Grace balances it all out. And Ruth's praying for the moms here this morning. It was all about grace from God. You don't have to do it perfectly. You won't. There's forgiveness. There's kindness. And God wants us to, to work, but he wants us to do that with a sense that we are under his gracious care. And he's not demanding more and better from us. In the end, Perfectionism all boils down to not understanding God's true heart for us, folks. Think about it. His humble, gentle, gracious heart. Perfectionists think they need to please somebody, and so they work hard to do it. If we understood and accepted his heart, received it, lived in it, we would find the perfectionism starting to drift away. How many of you need a yoke exchange today? And by yoke exchange, I mean taking off the one you're wearing right now that is exhausting you, that is too hard to bear, that is making you absolutely worn out, 
How many of you need to take that yoke off and put on the one that Jesus gives you that fits, that is easy, that is light, and in which he is yoked together with you? Anybody need a yoke exchange? That's something we're going to pray about, okay? So hang on. <laughs> Don't go away. One more. <laughs> One more gift. And this uh, last gift in the passage, far from the last thing God wants to give you. As a matter of fact, you might hear these three things and you go, I'm good in those things, but boy, do I need, you know, <laughs> this or this. That's fine. You know, you ever know what God is saying when, when, you, when you stand up here and bring his word. But the third thing in the passage is his apprenticeship. Apprenticeship. Verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. God invites us once again to let him teach us and instruct us and guide us and mentor us and show us what to do and how to do it and stop trying to figure out everything on our own. He is the master teacher who is more than willing and able to show us and tell us what we need to know. Be my apprentice, he says. That's his invitation. Imagine what it would be like to have Jesus as your mentor. Think about it. To be his apprentice. For me, I am totally drawn to a mentor or teacher who is humble, who is gentle in heart versus an uncaring, demanding t teacher. I'm drawn to a teacher whose operative words are rest, easy, and light. And I'm sure you're the same. So here's a question for you. If you could have Jesus mentor you in one thing this year, what would it be? In what way, in what area do you believe Jesus wants to mentor you for you to be his apprentice? In what specific area? For example, is it how to sit at his feet? How to take those two minutes of silence every day beginning your day, how to listen to him, how to hear his voice, how to love him, how to feel close to him, how to encounter his heart like never before. He would love to mentor you in that. He'd love to do that. He's waiting for that. Just got to say, that's what I want to learn. Or... Does he want to mentor you in discovering and developing the unforced rhythms of grace versus wearing yourself out by overwork? Does he want you to find an easier and lighter load in this new year and beyond? Jesus, I want to learn that. Does he want you to develop a daily practice of Bible reading and prayer? Just getting into the word, really getting in. I mean consistently. I'm talking every day. I used to say, you know what, if you're reading your Bible regularly, that's great. You know what, we got to read the Bible every single day of our lives, holidays included. I'm not kidding you. We can't afford to pull back, to kind of let it go, get out of the rhythm. It's so important to see, oh, Jesus, I need to learn that. That's hard for me. That's hard. It's hard for some of you. Some of you have drifted. And you know, this isn't, I'm not judging you. I'm not condemning anybody. I'm just saying it happens. I've done it too. We drift. Which is get away from that regular practice of, you know, being in his word. Even if it doesn't feel life-giving, even if it's not a blowing your mind away, it's still it's in the word. You're in the word, and God wants you to be there. Maybe that's it. God, help me learn how to become a faithful student of your Bible. Maybe it's how to share spiritual things with your family. You know, it's amazing and sad in so many cases how many family people can't talk to each other about what's going on in their faith. It's really hard, especially hard in marriages. Heart really goes out to those marriages where uh, the spouses can't talk to each other about what's deep in their minds, their hearts, their walk with God, what they're learning, what they're hearing. 
where they don't pray together. It's just sad. It's sad. And perhaps that's an area God wants to mentor you in this year. Getting closer, starting to have spiritual conversations in your families, starting with husband and wife, father, mother, children, whatever your family situation is. Lord, I need to learn that. That's so hard, but I need to learn it. How to share the gospel with somebody who needs to know the Lord. Lord, mentor me in how to be a faithful witness of yours without making somebody a project. A genuine friendship and love. I just want to be friends with those who don't know you so that somehow they can see in me your truth in life. Help me, Lord. I need to learn that. Show me who it is you want me to get to know better this year. Take that training to develop you professionally. God's interested in your job, your career. Maybe that's what he wants you to do. Grow professionally. Just get mentoring in the area of your calling, your your gifting. I don't know. I'm just throwing these things out. These are ideas God gave me. Take you to that next level of faith. Move in the power and anointing of the Spirit like you never have before. Greater filling of the Holy Spirit in your life. Late December, I had a really cool time with the Lord and just said, you know, what do you, what do you want to tell me for 2024? <clears throat> and um, you know what he said to me? He said, um, Bobby, what's the desire of your heart for this new year? I just couldn't believe how beautiful that is. What a gift, you know, for God to ask me, what's, what are the desires of your heart? And, you know, a lot of us Christians are afraid of that, right? Because you think, <gasps> my heart, you know, it's evil. I can't think of, you know. Here, look at guys. The closer we get to God, the more we get to know him, the desires of our hearts change to become his desires. Don't be afraid of the desires of your heart. And so the freedom that he gives us is his maturing sons and daughters. You know, what's on your heart, Bobby, for the new year? And I, I, did, I came up with four things. And um, interestingly enough, they all involve increase. Increase seems to be a word for 2024, by the way. And when we were praying on Tuesday with our prayer group here, it came up more than once. There's something about increase for 2024. And uh, we'll see how that unfolds in the year to come. But for me, there's four things, and they're very personal. I won't share them publicly, but I'm just saying, you know, um, one of the, well, I will share one of the things, because you know me, and you know this is nothing I'm, that I, I've talked about this many times. I just want to be used by God in prayer ministry and to see his healing power, his anointing, to see lives really changed uh, through my prayers for people. And so I'm just asking God to increase it. Just increase it this year, Lord. He's more than delighted to do that, you know? He's offering his mentoring. And so right now I'm reading through Matthew and I'm just taking copious notes about how he healed people. Like, how did you do it? And it's fantastic to see. So often he used touch. I won't even be, that's a whole other sermon series, but just he's mentoring me in this thing. And so I'm just asking you, what is it? What is the specific area? There's the question that you want Jesus to mentor you in in 2024. And let me say one more thing about mentoring, and then we're going to be done and pray for each other, is this apprenticeship is not meant to be an isolated, solitary effort. You know, just you and God. Um, He puts human partners in your life. He will provide mentors, human mentors for you as well, to help you grow at each of these areas. And I can never be more thankful for the mentors I have in this church who are teaching me how to pray effectively for people to see God's power released. And you know what? It's better to pray for people in groups anyway. And it's two or three. So it's so important that we understand that apprenticeship is a team effort, a church family effort. And we will find support and encouragement from other apprentices, like we all are. We're all being apprenticed. We're all on a journey of growth and becoming like our great teacher, the master, Jesus Christ. So there you go. (sighs) Will you come to him today? Come to me, he said, for what are the three again? Rest. What was the second one? Yoke. Thank you. And then this one, apprenticeship. Apprenticeship. 